Good evening. Thanks for being here on such a wretched night. And what a big turnout. We've uh, busted right out of the temple tonight. I'm a little intimidated with America's rabbi and the god slayer, Chris Hitchens, right here. <laughs> Maybe you should be a little intimidated in this community. For all you know, I'm the son of snake handlers and primitive Baptists. <laughs> in fact, uh, I am. So we'll see what happens here. I hope that doesn't mean a prejudice in this debate. I made a mistake in, uh, with my third child. I waited until she could speak to have her baptized. And when the baptism, you know, water on head. And when the preacher, you know, got the water with the droplets and uh, began to put it on her head and he said it was in the name of God and she said, what is God? Let's just do it. Let's start with the simplicity of a child. What is God, Rabbi? Well, it depends who you're answering. If you're answering a two-year-old, you answer one way. But if you're answer, discussing it with an adult, you begin with a recognition, which actually the entire debate should be framed with, of human limitation. In the following sense, when you were two years old, could you imagine what it's like to be an adult? Of course not. A two-year-old has no idea what an adult is like. And yet we make definitive statements about God all the time when in every religion that I know of, the distance between God and human beings is infinitely greater than the distance between an adult and a two-year-old. So when I say, as I'm going to in a second, I'm not going to avoid your question, but understand that I say it against the background of a religious recognition of our own inability to understand that which is infinitely greater than ourselves. I, my thumbnail definition of what God is, is that God is the source of everything that exists, and God is someone, something with whom a human being can have a relationship and that you can live your life in alignment with a godly purpose. But any definition that is greater than that is in some ways to traduce God, which is why, by the way, the title of Christopher's book is exactly right. God is not great. Because to say God is great or God is something is to put a definition on God, which we know from classical Jewish philosophy you ought not to do. So in fact, Christopher's exactly right, and we can wrap it up right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. It's been a wonderful well, thanks, evening. Yes. Uh, apologies perhaps to Muslims in the audience who say God is great all the time. We'll, we'll circle back. Okay. Chris Hedges, to you. If, um, Answer my daughter's mind, question. Maybe you'll warn her off. If you don't mind, it would be Christopher and Hitchin. Yes, sir. Chris Hedges is a horrible... Hedges? Did I say Hedges? Yes, you did. Forgive um, me. Chris Hedges is a horrible apologist for liberation. Christopher <laughs> Hitchens. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> too many guests, too little Sorry, time. Sorry, but um, I exist too, if you see what I mean. I yes, <laughs> yes. May as well start by establishing that ontological yes. claim. Well, um, Friedrich Nietzsche famously said that God was dead. And Sigmund Freud can be rendered as having said that God was dad. Um, and I think both of them are probably right. The, the concept of God is, a, is like everything else in our vocabulary, man-made. It's an invention of human beings. It, it, unless you take the view that God made us, um, in which case it would be a lot to explain. How many, why did we in that case make so many gods? It does seem to be much, very much more probable that men and women made many gods and that any one god made all men and women and the rest of creation. And as well as being man-made, it's fear-made. It is the unexpressed or partially expressed wish for a protector, a parent, someone who will never desert you, someone who will do in a way you're thinking for you, especially on questions of moral philosophy. At its best, it's that. It's a, it's a wish to be loved more than you probably deserve. And at its worst, it's the, it's the underdeveloped part of the human psyche that leads to totalitarianism, that, that wants to worship and that wants a boss, that wants a celestial dictatorship. And that's the bit that's now threatening to destroy our secular civilization. And so you're quite right to start where you do. Um, it used to be believed, I mean, the, the number of gods now is it, it's infinite and a new god is created almost every day by some cult or other, but it used to be that. There was a belief that gods were in the trees, in the, in the woods, in the springs, in the sea, in the clouds, and so forth. Polytheism of a kind. Then 
something a bit more polytheistic, like Olympus, where there was at least a location for the divine, but it was multifaceted. And then monotheism, getting it down to one. So I regard this as progress of a sort, because they're getting nearer the true figure all the time. I, I actually... Rabbi, yes, yes. Progress. Um, maybe. Which is why, well, the, which by the way, is why the Vatican in its old, old days was very upset by the concept of zero. Didn't like zero at all, the most important number of all, the number without which you can't do anything, mm -hmm. um, which wasn't there in Roman numerals. No, it was um, invented in Islamic also, civilization, and actually. It also struck them as a sinister import from, from in part of us in Fidelium, from, from pagan lands, but also the, trouble, the concept of zero was very troubling for theism, and must be, and, and does indeed remain so. It's one of the many, many ways in which theism is not compatible with the scientific worldview. Ra Rabbi Bobby, may oh. I ask you? I, I, just want, I just want to point out, without even taking issue with yeah. the, the incorrect statements that he made, um, <laughs> well, but I want you, I want you to why, understand, why you, I want you, you, want you, want you to understand, wait, 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 I want you to understand the, the progress of the argument that you just heard, because it's important that people do this all the time, and at least you should be aware of it, whether you accept <laughs> it or not. Very often when people argue with you, especially when they argue about religion, they attribute their own beliefs to logic and your belief to psychology. So religious people believe in something because they need to be loved or they need a crutch or they're weak, but I believe what I believe because it's true and scientific. And I just want you to be aware that you cannot actually disprove someone's belief by imputing an unworthy motive to it. You actually have to disprove the belief. So don't let Christopher pull the psychological wool over your eyes. You can actually be just as worthy or unworthy of love, just as tough-minded, just as thoughtful, just as deep, and still believe in God, as most human beings have throughout all of human history, as if you are Christopher Hitch. Christopher, are you a trickster? Well, I don't think that, you couldn't accuse that of being an incorrect statement. You could accuse it of being an incomplete one. I didn't give all the reasons why people believe in God. But after all, you did write a whole book that argues that the belief in God can be very useful to people in times of crisis. Did you not? not I mean, that's, uh, I don't, and that's... Yes, but I never said reason. that that was why you should people believe in God. Know, and, and I don't think it is the reason why many people do. But remember okay. that there's, there are two questions. That were, I better now say, lest I be accused of not having exhausted the entire subject in my first response. I better say there are at least two questions. <clears throat> One is this, <clears throat> is there a God, a, a creator, a prime mover, an uncaused cause, whatever you like to call it? And this was the question answered at a certain point, not very long ago in our history, but by the deists, people like Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, and many others who said that the order of the universe seemed to suggest that the, it couldn't just have been random, um, that there the may have been a designer, but the, the designer didn't take any part in human affairs. And that, in the, in the late 17th, early 18th centuries, was probably, eight, sorry, late 18th, early 19th centuries, was probably a very intelligent position to hold. It was as far, pre-Einstein, pre-Darwin, was probably as far as you were likely to get with philosophical speculation. But, so believing that there might be a cause or a mover or a creator is one thing, but believing that there is a supervising, intervening entity who cares who wins the war, who cares who you sleep with and in what way, who cares what you eat and on what day, and in other words, who, who makes you the center of the whole cosmos, um, is another thing altogether. So people who say, I believe in God, I'm a deist, have all their work in front of them before they can say that they are really religious. Are you prepared to be a deist? No. No divine mover even at the, whatever, the there, origin. There's nothing in the natural in the cosmic order, or that's the macro level, or the micro level, that's to say the constituent of our own DNA and the things that we have in common with the other animals, and indeed other, uh, other forms of life like plants, that isn't susceptible to a much better explanation. Well, here's... Um, it, it was, as, as the great physicist Laplace said when, um, when he demonstrated his working model, his orrery, as it's called, of the solar system to the emperor, and Napoleon said, well, I see there's no God in this system, and Laplace said, well, your majesty, it works without that assumption. Rabbi, I, I, I don't want to play God, but okay. to give form to this. Sure. Um, it's 2010. You said you, you think of God as the source of all. In the year uh, BCE, uh, BCE, 2010, why attribute the source of all to divinity? What about science? 
And you just said. Well, that's right, exactly what I was just going to address. Them. Is the first of all, um, there there are two separate ways of thinking about this. Both, and and I'll I'll offer them both briefly, and you can decide uh, if both or neither is congenial to you. One is that, of course, you can't equate God and proof for God and discussion of God with a demonstration in a laboratory. That's never been the case. The idea is different, to shift it differently, which is this. I would ask you this question instead. Deep down, do you believe that the universe is constituted only by stuff, by material, or is there a mystery at the heart of things? Do you believe that you are purely synapses, or is there something immaterial and eternal about you and those you love? Do you believe that things like love are just an epiphenomena of the way evolution has put us all together? Or do you think there is something that in the fact that immaterial things like ideas and love and consciousness have such a profound influence on our lives that leads you to believe that the intangible can be at least as real or more real than the tangible? If that way of looking at the world appeals to you or speaks to you, then you understand that Laplace, in order to explain how the heavens go, may not need the hypothesis of God, but that in order to explain why there is something rather than nothing, why there is a deeper meaning to life than stuff alone, that that's something that speaks to you and lets you understand that God is real. That's part one. Wait, wait, wait. Part two, part two is... There are, in fact, things that are suggestive of something greater in even the scientific worldview, which is why, by the way, in the American Academy of Science, more than half consistently, and this has been true for the last 100 years, 51, 52% of scientists say that they believe in God. And that is the fact that everything exists rather than nothing, that consciousness, which is still inexplicable to human beings, is real, that I make sounds, and which is immaterial, and it touches you in some way, that want, makes you want to change things. The, the way of looking at the world, even from what we can see and touch and feel, suggests that there's something greater than what we know. And now, go right ahead. Um, I, can't, I can't paraphrase him properly, but <clears throat> you really ought to get hold of, it's easy to find on, on Google, a lecture given by Lawrence Krauss, who I regard as the greatest living physicist. And it's, it's about the quantum. Um, and it's about a whole universe from nothing. It's exactly how you get from nothing to something, in fact, quite a lot of things. Um, one means by which this happens is the following. Uh, every second that we're speaking, a, a star the size of our sun or bigger goes out, blows up or goes out. That's been the case every single second since the first moment of the Big Bang. It's a lot. But that'll be a lot of suns going out um, as we speak. And there's a lot of annihilation, isn't it? There's a lot of destruction. It's on a, it's a, a rather what you might call almost a wasteful scale. It does have the positive outcome, though, that we are all constituted of those materials. We are made of stardust. Now, I find that a rather more majestic and wonderful and even beautiful idea <coughs> than, say, the idea of the burning bush. A bit more impressive. Uh, gives you more to think about. Are they also, mutually also exclusive? Also has the Are they mutually exclusive? Wouldn't well, God make you a star? One, one has the virtue of being true and provable and studyable, which the other doesn't. And I, I do think that the verifiability of something is, is a virtue of Are we kind. simply material beings? Yes. We, we don't have bodies. We are bodies. Until 50,000 years ago, there were four other kinds of, of biped, humanoid, not unlike us, still living on the planet, died leaving no descendants. We're the only survivors of, of those of people, um, that, that family. We're the last. They, we don't know if they had gods or not. So you so think it's inexplicable? No, no, no religion ever invented appears to have known that these creatures even existed because the, the, the religious are forced to believe that the only really significant event that happened in the human story happened about 3,000 years ago. Are the mysteries the 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 inexplicable? Concept. Are we no. just waiting? That's not true. Them? No, it's so that, that's no. factually all not of this, true. All of, this, all of this massive Big Bang cos uh, cosmological churning and destruction and, and, and annihilation, which is paralleled, by the way, on our own Earth, where 99% of all species that have ever been on the planet have already gone extinct, leaving no descendants. All of this could be part of a plan. 
There is no way an atheist can prove it's not. But it's some plan, isn't it? With m mass destruction, pitiless extermination, uh, annihilation going on all the time, and all of this set in motion on a scale that's absolutely beyond our imagination in order that the Pope can tell people not to jerk off. <laughs> Rabbi, yeah, stupid. Right. Now, I think... Think, Rabbi, is, I think here we, we've it's reached... Ch actually, it's childish to be... We've reached an area of agreement. Um, <laughs> I, too, repudiate that statement by the Pope, and I'm, I'm happy to do it publicly. Um, I, uh, I'm, no, 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 wait just, just a second. Hold on. The... Um, First of all, it's just not true that religions don't actually acknowledge very important things that happened before their own founding. Just read the beginning of the Bible, uh, which goes back far beyond the founding of the Bible. But more important than that, there are actually things that if you are material, you can't give an accounting of. For example, you might not believe that you have free will. You might think that everything you do was predetermined from the beginning of the Big Bang. And just the fact, by the way, that all of the universe, physics tells us, came from something tinier than the head of a pin is, to me, there is no word other than miraculous for it, but nonetheless. You might believe that all the, everything you did, the words tonight, the fact that those flowers would be orange on the table, that was all predetermined from the beginning of time. But if you believe that you actually make a choice, that human beings have free will, then I ask you how you account for that. You didn't pick your birth your genetics, you didn't pick your environment, so from the very beginning all of that was predetermined for you, and unless there is something immaterial about you that allows you to choose, then everything human beings do is already set from the beginning of time. I don't understand how you get free will <coughs> if you don't have God. Christopher. It's pathetic, I'm, I'm sorry to say, it's a, to, to say of the, the cosmological and the genetic that these are deterministic processes, they're not at all. They're full of extraordinary randomness and in the genetic case of mutation. Stephen Jay Gould, the great paleontologist, wrote a book which I recommend to you called The Burgess Shale, which is a, it's the side of a mountain in Canada, in the Canadian Rockies, that's sheared off. So you can, read, you can see the inside of a mountain. You can see it as if you're looking at a blackboard and you can see the growth and development of species and you realize that it's not a tree. It's more like a bush. Yeah, because the reverse branches that go off and don't go nowhere and the others that succeed um, and, and uh, different kinds of failure and different kinds of mutation. His most exciting thought, most revolutionary thought is this, if you could so to speak put all that onto a tape and rewind it and then press play again, there's no certainty it would come out the same way. In fact there's every reason to believe that it would not. So there's nothing predetermined, there's nothing deterministic about this at all. And thanks to your understanding of our genetics which are also not predetermined because they're a result of random mutation and natural selection, as everyone now knows. And that's why we can have, sad to say for the kosher, but we can have skin transplants and organ transplants from pigs who are much closer to us than we used to think. Um, we can also sequence the DNA of viruses and learn how to immunize ourselves from it. It works, in other words. But yes, it can be tampered with, it can be engineered for good as well as for ill. There's nothing deterministic about it at all. It's, it's much more exciting, it's mm -hmm. much more interesting, it's much more rewarding, it's verifiable, and yes, there are elements of, I was trying to say, the miraculous, the awe-inspiring, the tragic, the majestic in this, that there simply are not in the incantations of Genesis where the, the supposed authors claim to know the divinity, the creator, on personal terms. This is nonsense, it's for children. Rabbi? Uh, there First of all, it is interesting. I mean, Stephen Gould, who was, by the way, very sympathetic to religion and wrote a book called Rocks of Ages, which I also recommend to you, where he said that uh, religion and science don't overlap. Um, they sure do. But he, wait, wait, one second. <laughs> if you read his book on the Burgess Sale, he does say if you rewind, then you assume if you push play again, you would get a different result. And that's certainly true unless the result was intended. But more important than that, Yes, there's randomness in the system. Nobody would argue that there isn't randomness in the system. But randomness isn't free will. Randomness is getting a result you don't expect. The question is, how do you get a directed choice, which isn't random? I choose right now to pick this glass up. Now, how did I make that choice 
if I'm purely a product of my DNA and my environment, then it's not a choice. Then it was programmed in, then it's instinct. And the whole point that religions always made about instinct was that human beings can rise above it. Unlike animals, which are the same at age two as they are at age 10, as they are at age 15, a human being grows and changes and chooses. That's the basis of religious I have to say, to me, it doesn't seem a matter of religion that I can choose to pick up this class. That seems to me to be well within what could develop everything else does, when in fact the Judaism of thousands of years ago ought to be, must be, should be, is expected to be different from the Judaism of today. Still has course. ten commandments. Yes, none of okay, it guys, guys, mention goodness. Guys, you have to let me finish my statement, okay? okay? Please. It's, it's, thank you. Um, You're welcome. I feel a little bit between a sandwich here, um, but the second, and the second part of it is that if you say that faith does nothing for you, as Christopher repeats over and over again, it's very hard to explain why it is that millions and millions of people all over the world and throughout history have felt that faith deepens their life, gives them meaning, increases their goodness, and why it is, for example, in America, that people of faith give more to charity, um, vote more in elections, volunteer more, help more. Do you know what the largest aid organization is, aid and development organization in the United States? It's not CARE. It's not Save the Children. It's a One World, which is a Christian organization out of Seattle, which not only gives millions and millions and millions of dollars across the world, but sends people all across the world to the most beleaguered, helpless places. And they do it because they believe they're called to do it by God. It's just not true that having faith makes no difference in this world. It makes a tremendous difference, and the vast majority of that difference, not all of it, but the vast majority of that difference is for goodness. Let me put a question then, if, if you'd be so good. The rabbi, feels, the rabbi feels in a sandwich, and I don't mean for you to feel in a sandwich. No, so let me put this to you. Uh, oh, that's okay. Christopher, what about uh, the solace of faith? Uh, some of the most religious people I know ended up there, Oh, this when, is a softball. No, I want well, a hard well, No, I mean, I, I know what he's going to say to this. Well, maybe, but you he's hard minded, hard hearted, non meter of yes, solace. You're, worse, you're a misanthrope because you're not sympathetic <laughs> to people's need for religion. I say in my book, available at fine bookstores everywhere, <laughs> that as, as long as I don't have to hear about it, I don't mind what people believe. If they say, well, thanks to Joseph Smith and his gold plates, I have real faith now, and I've got a family, and I have friends, and I have a real system, and so on, I say, fine, fine. Just don't come to my front door with it. <laughs> don't ask for a tax break for it. Don't ask my children to be taught it in the school. Did you sign up shouldn't, tonight thinking you wouldn't hear it? about I, it? And I ask, I, ask them a I ask the question in the book. People think they have a personal relationship with the creator, and they, they're the possessors of a wonderful secret. And, and it must feel, I've never felt it, but it, I presume it feels great. Why doesn't it make them happy? They're not happy. They can't be happy until everyone else believes it too. They go out and proselytize, very often, no. and, and here's, I can't let your, first, your last answer go, very often in the guise of charity. You notice how often that religion, rather than answer the questions that I've put, like how do you know there's a God, what evidence do you have for it? Which you say, well, lots of good people do good things because they're religious. Well, let's take the most recent pressing case. Uh, Richard Dawkins and I and a few others in the response to the Haiti earthquake set up a, an emergency charity for people of non-belief to give to because so many charitable organizations are, in fact, proselytizing groups. So we raised about $2 million in a weekend. And all that money goes straight. And by the way, thank you. If you go to Richard's website, you can find out more about how to donate to this because it's, it's permanent. It's going to stay in being. We, all that money went straight to... Um, Doctors Without Borders, of course, and the International Red Cross, which though it has a cross, isn't a religious organization. Both these organizations are already in Haiti. They're proven. No, none of the money goes to support any missionary activity. None. And the Scientologists and all the others who turned up in Haiti, and the people who turned up in Haiti to kidnap babies to convert them to their faith, and the Catholics who turned up and said, standing in the ruins of their own cathedral, with a quarter of a million Haitians buried under the rubble, said, God spoke here today, and you should listen to his message. Don't tell me that's good. Don't tell me that's good. That's wicked. It's proselytizing. It's proselytizing with the helpless, using them as objects of charity 
and conversion. It's lying to people. But there's also a lot it's of wrong to there. lie. But, 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 it's wrong to lie to people. And it's giving, them, it's giving them false hopes and false explanations for their plight. Now, we're not guilty of any of that. And now I'll ask you another question. Where in the Decalogue does the word goodness appear? Where? That's a good swathe of Exodus for you. Where in Exodus does the word goodness appear? Where in this commandment-rich territory does the word goodness or the enjoyment to be good occur? This should be a softball well, for you. Okay. Um, it, first of all, it tells, you, it tells you what you ought not to do. It says, love your neighbor as yourself in the, in the book of Leviticus. I mean, I'm allowed to move to Leviticus from Exodus. Yes, I, I think assume. that's fair. Yes, right. yes, that's fair. Yes, okay. Um, thank you. I appreciate right. that. It says you should pursue but justice, no. justice, justice you shall pursue. It says it over and over and over again. And also, by the way, I, I, you know, no tradition, at least certainly not the Jewish tradition, and, and I'm not aware of any other tradition, is only the Bible. Judaism is a long exegetical tradition, and it says several times in the Talmud that the one purpose of the mitzvot is litzareth tabriot, which means to refine human character. It's clear that Judaism is directed around goodness. It's repeated over and over again. The whole system and framework of mitzvot are to get people to treat each other decently. And if you say, which you do, that people use authority, governmental authority, religious authority, um, military authority, political authority, to do bad things, my answer is, of course they do. Anytime you set up a structure of authority, yeah. people will do bad things. That's Churches, right, but other things. I, but that isn't what I said. But, but that, the, yes, of course. So what you say is, what you heard is, when religion does good things, it doesn't count because sometimes they want people to believe what they believe. When it does bad things, it's because of religion. When you make everything good that happens that religion does invalid, and everything bad that religion does uh, representative, that's called arguing in bad faith, which is ironic for someone who has none. Oh. It seems a fair well, question. Yes, but it's not, I mean, as, as I know you know, that isn't at all what I say. I don't say it's th bad things are done in the name of religion or by authorities. I say it's religion itself that is the problem. I go out of my way to make clear that I don't take refuge in any other position. Now, in Leviticus and in Exodus, if you're a neighbor, you better not, and you, you're, this person's best, you're supposed to love him, this person had better not be an Amalekite, a Midianite, a Moabite, Better not, yes. be a, better not be a witch, yep. who, who, the destruction of whom is enjoined. Right. Better not be a homosexual, the stoning of whom is enjoined. Better not be a slave, the terms of, of, sla of enslavement of which are all laid out. Now, these are primitive, tribal, agricultural. Most of the commandments, by the way, all, all the Decalogue, by the way, is addressed to the property owning classes. Here's what you can't do with your servants. Here, your servants must also obey this commandment. Why are the commandments addressed only to people who have staff? Why are the women, a, a, rather a large objection, I would have thought, why are the women counted as part of the animal and chattel that's disposable by these uh, holders of property? Um, it's, couldn't it be any more obvious that this is a man-made phenomenon and at a time when people were not at their best and were full of fear and ignorance and greed and uh, covetousness of other people's can, can we be faithful and not be trapped by history? Not all of its elements are Well, it's, I, I, it's not only that, but as Christopher knows very well, I assume that the Bible was put together by human beings and that the Jewish tradition is a long evolving tradition as are other traditions in which the dross of history is gradually refined in the same way that you would not expect someone 3,000 years ago to be able to understand the sort of arguments that you're making tonight. People change. There's an evolutionary process also, not only to biology, but to sociology, to ideology, all of those things. And that's why the question is very much, does religion make people better? And can these systems refine themselves? And can they get rid of the stuff that's bad in religion? And I think that uh, to assume that you can cherry pick the things in the statements in religion that are negative, and those things are necessarily enduring contradicts the history of every tradition I know. Well, cherry-picking is an odd word to use for something that's thrust upon you. I've no, got no choice but to study the Decalogue. No, actually... So I, I point not. out it says it's addressed right. to property owners and uh, enjoining them to keep women as property. So are you... Oh, you're cherry-picking. Are you, you, in, are you in favor of theft, <laughs> murder, and adultery? Do you it's think those are good things? Well, there's, now, here's, the, there's exactly the number for my question. If what you it say is. is true... Yes. Not that... I, and I've never said... I, wouldn't, I couldn't be interpreted as having said no religious person can do a good thing. 
If you no, but if what you right. say is true, this should be true, and you should find it easy to point it out. Okay. There must be something, not that they can do or do, but that I cannot do, that's a good thing. Either a moral statement made, or a moral or ethical statement performed, that a person of faith could perform that I cannot. Now, you, you must be able to identify that now actually, if your point is to have any how can you? How, how can one human being do something that another human being can't do physically? Physically, of course, you could do anything that I could do, but I can say lots of things you no, don't do. Moral, moral I can say lots of things you don't do, not that you can't do. You probably don't do, as I do, bless your child on a Friday night. You probably don't create great works of art based on religion. You probably don't go halfway across the world feeling that you're motivated and called by a God who tells you to help other human beings. I mean, all those things are things that religion motivates people to do, not that you can't do them, but that people generally don't do them if they're not motivated well, by on, religion. To get real, I mean, pronouncing an incantation yes. isn't a moral action. Of or, course or, it or is. Or is it? No, it isn't. It's, only, it's, it's no. only not a moral action if you don't it feel... Can subject, you don't it can feel subjectively be enormous... enormous it's not you, a moral action. Anyway, it is something, moral, it is wait, something, it is, wait, it is not, something I could do. It's not... I, so I know, of course you can, and I encourage you to do it. Yeah. Um, it's only not a moral action one day. you don't feel None. the unique expression of love when it takes place in an atmosphere of sanctity that is not the same as saying to a child, I love you. I have to tell you, I mean, some of you knew my father, who passed away in May, who was a rabbi. When I think of the most powerful and intimate moments that I had with my father, it was when he put his hands on my head and blessed me on a Friday night. Now, he would not have done that were he not religious, and it wasn't the same as when he kissed me goodnight and said, I love you because there is an element in which religious people dwell. It's called a world of sanctity that you can't invoke and can't dwell in if you don't believe that that realm exists. Could, 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 so do you, well, wait. First, I'm sorry for your loss, <laughs> the Irish say. Sorry for your trouble. Right. Uh, second, uh, that, uh, uh, but I'm still going to have to insist, I don't think anyone in the audience can, can, can consider that's an answer to my challenge. Of course to say there's a, a moral or ethical statement or action that a, an unbeliever could not perform. But could not means that you're physically incapable of it. And no. I'm willing to concede no, right here, goodness, it would you be can do effective. everything I can do. Well, that's of not course that you can. Let's go, let's of go course that. you can. All right, well then, okay. I mean, how, All right. the you have to say wouldn't do. You well, can't say I will can't leave, do. Since you won't answer it, I'll just leave the question to the audience. If anyone I can come up to me and say, here's a moral thing you couldn't do, not don't do, but could not do, that a religious per only a religious person do, I'd be very interested to hear of it. No well, one's ever come up with anything. Let me ask a Second, question. Second, there was a brief corollary. Think of a wicked thing done, or an evil thing said, that is done precisely because of faith. You've already thought of one. But any that, wait, but any that someone who doesn't have faith couldn't do? And now wait, thought, tell me one that someone no, who I doesn't have faith no, could not do. I didn't say that. Okay, it's the, the, but that's exactly the point. No, it's not. A human being can do certain things, whether they're believers or not, they have the physical ability. It's still doesn't, Believing something so doesn't give you a new physical you, ability. It's no problem to you that the suicide murder community, the genital mutilation community, these are all faith-based communities. Um, do you want and me to answer that? while we're on the subject of charity, who doesn't hear Hamas saying, the reason we're loved by our people is because we provide social services. We, we, we help the needy. We're the only people who come out and do that. Which is, by the way, I'm horrified to have to say is true. But do you, do you excuse them for that because they're charitable? Of course no. not. Do you not think that they bless their children a whole lot? Yes. And I, I think that's can, a beautiful thing I've heard them do. do it. Right. You try but being, you I don't think, try I don't being think a Muslim they're... children and not be, a child not be blessed the entire time. Um, that's part of the authority that they claim. They claim to own I, I want to ask, who's... This is who, all faith-based. Who, who steps up to... You won't like any of the language, but life has a lot of despair. People fall into despair. Who steps up to save? And I don't mean in Christian terms necessarily at all, but who steps up to reach out to those people? And for society as a whole, if you don't have the teaching of religion, what will offer a kind of moral construct. I don't see it in schools. I don't, union halls are gone. Uh, who, who's going to give people I live a, in such a, a world. structure of a structure I live in such meaning. a world. It's called Hollywood. Hollywood. It, well, well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, right. what, it, it may have blemishes. It may be deeply flawed. It may be f fatally flawed, you would say, but what's the substitute, what's the structure for moral teaching I and think, save the despairing? I think despair is quite a good starting point myself. I mean, I think it's very good to know that we're born into a losing struggle. I think that the stoicism that comes from that and the reflection that comes from that is very useful. I'm not very impressed by people who say, well, I wish it wasn't true, so I'll try and act as if it isn't. It is true. Everything is governed by en entropy and, and decline and annihilation and disaster. 
and um, you're born into a losing struggle, and because you're a mammal primate, primate mammal, you know you are, and you know you're going to die, and that there'll be a lot of struggle and pain on the way. I don't want a world without anxiety and grief and pain and struggle. I, want, I, I, I can't get it. No one's saying I, you can't have But those who offer it to me, I spurn the gift. I don't want what you want. I don't want the feeling of eternal love and peace. Love and peace, very, very overrated in my view. One reason, <laughs> one, reason one, one of the many reasons actually I should despise all religions equally, but one I, and I do in a way. But in one way which I prefer Judaism to the, its rivals is that the emphasis is, is more on justice than on love. I want to go to the rabbi, why is that not misanthropic of you? That attitude. Misanthropic doesn't mean I have to hate people. Well, it's, it's it means I, it means I, but it means I respect it's hard them. It means I respect bad. them enough. It means I respect them enough not to offer them false consolation. I do think it's important. The realm of illusion will, will not help you to cure this condition. I do think it's important to say that part of this, part of this is based in temperament, but also part of it is based in life experience. I spend a lot of my time at the bedside of people who are dying, with parents who lost children, with husbands who lost wives and wives who lost husbands. The sense of community that is created by religion the sense that life is meaningful even if it's short. All of that, it's not trivial, it's not cheap consolation, it's not illusion, it goes to the depths of the questions that human beings ask themselves. And I know that you can make a, a clever remark about the cheap selling of religious consolation, but you know what, the remark gets melted by the heat of human anguish when you're standing beside the grave of a child who died and the mother is saying a prayer and that brings her some measure of comfort because she really does believe that this world in some sense is meaningful and is not nihilistic and is not empty and is not foolish. And, and although I can't prove to you in an empirical sense that in fact the world is meaningful, at that moment, even as I question it, it seems to me the deepest instinct of my soul. Well, if you'll... Gosh. Um, well, if you'll pardon me, I won't share any of my griefs with you. Um, uh, but I've never had one or had any, known anyone who had one who's had the faintest consolation from religion. And indeed, being told, as the Christians tell them, that they're off to a better place and so on, I think it's positively wicked thing to do. I think lying to the dying for a living, what, 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 what self-respecting person can do that? Um, and you know it's a lie and, and because, when, once I, you just say, tell me how you know it's a lie, once since you, you assert it again and again. Because the person saying it cannot possibly know it to be true. And therefore it's a lie. They don't have access to information. Even if they believe it, it's yes, a lie. Yes, it's, it's a lie. But okay. how do we create, for those who aren't able or don't desire to walk around in despair, or to walk around in irony, in, in a world that brings, can bring plenty try of despair? It, try it, try it. Try it, fine. But I think it's manifestly clear lots of people don't choose that. So what does atheism offer? Well, it offers the chance of living without illusion, which I think and, uh, it says well, that no, philosophy, no, no. philosophy and literature will do a great deal more for you. They're much more, there's a lot more morality in them. There's a lot more ethical discussion in, in Dostoevsky, say. It, it may be true, but who will present them in George, our society, George, in a real George society? Elliot. Who will well, present them I'm, in a way I'm, to create there is. For now, I'm presenting. There is. For now, I'm presenting. <laughs> right. I can't Good. do... You're going to be very I busy. Can, I can only appear in my own person here. Oh. I, can, I, I can even say that to some extent it works for me. This irony, I think, is tremendously useful, uh, as, uh, as, as is philosophy, especially the philosophy of Spinoza, especially in times of anguish. And the, and the realization that there's no false consolation can actually cheer you up. But, Once but, you but, face the fact that you're born into a losing struggle, things immediately appear a great deal more uh, manageable in some ways. Um, and really, of the remarks against this, maybe not one of these remarks couldn't have been made by a devout member of the Muslim Brotherhood. And what, what I want to ask him is this. If anything of what he says is true, is he really saying that he would, he would prefer me not to be myself, not to be an unbeliever, and someone who believes in, in irony and uh, of the unillusioned world, but I'd be morally better off if I was a, a Wahhabi Muslim, for example. Is me asking, or Roman is Catholic. he me? Does he, this, are you asking this scenario? Okay. Okay. I mean, okay. according to you, no, I would well, be a better person. No, 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 person don't, don't answer the question. You asked me the question. Right. You're not allowed to answer it for me. You imply. <laughs> I imply. Well, I want okay. to know if you really mean mm. that. Uh, actually, I never said that you were automatically better off if you believed than you didn't believe. I think Christopher is very useful in the world. 
because he forces religious people I mean, he's useful for many, many reasons, obviously, to the world, but he also forces religious people to think seriously about their faith. And as I understand the God that I believe in and the God that Judaism presents, the first and primary demand is not belief. The first and primary demand is goodness. That's exactly what characterizes Judaism. And therefore, if you say to me, I'm a good person, but I don't believe, is it better that I would be a miserable person who believed? I, all I have to do is look at the sources and say, obviously not. Obviously, it's better for you to be who you are and to promote goodness in the world. That's exactly l'takeno lamba malchut shaddai is what the Jewish tradition teaches, to make the world better under the sovereignty of God. But notice the, the first clause in that is to make the world better. So if you do that, that's the primary demand of any faith that I think is worth its salt. May we turn on that point to what Barry Schreg raised as an acute concern, that is violence. And the question of whether violence is integral to religion, integral to religion, or exceptional and an offense to religion, or both, or all three, violence and religion. Okay, so I'm going to try to abbreviate this. There are two things to remember. First of all, most religious conflicts are not about religion. What you find is religions will fight when there's land, when there's power, when there's resources, when there's water, when there's money. It's very rare for a religious group, not, not inconceivable, but very rare for a religious group to say, hey, guess what? There's someone halfway across the world who believes differently. Let's go get them. It's the people who live next door to us who are other than us. We, sh other than us, we should get them. And by the way, along the way, we're going to take their land and we're going to take their riches and we're going to take this. And that's... Because, and if you look in the encyclopedia of war, which is probably not something that you peruse in your leisure hours, but if you do, you will see that it identified 1,763 wars since the beginning of time. 123 of them are identified as religious wars. When you take religion out of a society, you don't get a more peaceful society. We look at the 20th century. It was like a laboratory for that. Stalinism, Maoism, Nazism. Cambodia, North Korea versus South Korea, on and on and on and on. The fact is the record of extracting religion is very poor. And the final point is this, which is if you ask why religious people fight, the answer is clear. It's because they're people. I have a colleague, in, not a rabbi, but a, a psychologist in um, Los Angeles who studies bullying. Do you know at what age bullying is most prominent? Think to yourself what age, and then I'll tell you the answer by far. The answer is preschool. Because we're not born all sweetness and light. It's why it's so much hard work to get a kid to be good. Right? Parents don't have to say to their child, why don't you share a little bit less? You know, Because you're really, you're too selfless, you're too kind. Instead, it's very hard work to get people to do well. What religions are known for is their attempts to make something straight of the crooked nature of human beings. And they fail again and again and again, exactly as you would expect if you know human nature. But that doesn't mean that the attempt to do it makes people worse. Quite the opposite, at least according to the evidence of history. <clears throat> well, Mr. violence, Mr. Is, there's no mystery about violence. I mean, violence arises because we are primates, Im imperfectly evolved. Our prefrontal lobes are too small, our adrenaline glands are too big. Um, there are various other deformities of this kind. Sexual organs designed by a committee, all the rest of it. <laughs> and we're, gre uh, we're greedy and... We're back to politics, we're greedy, we're greedy and fearful. And, um, but and covetous of other people's... Pro and also, uh, surprisingly, it's our, probably our biggest defect given that the reason we're so successful is there's almost no genetic difference between us. If we were dogs, we'd all be the same. Breed, a fantastically little variation. But we're incredibly prone to tribalism and ethnic and racial, uh, yes. what Freud calls the narcissism of small differences. So, of course, if a tribe, let's say, that's calling itself the children of Israel, for the sake of argument, <coughs> decides that it should kill all the other tribes in, that get in its way, take their women as slaves, butcher their men, um, take their land, take their cattle, and so battle in this way across to Canaan and take everyone else's land and burn down there. That's going to happen whether there's a God or not, or whether there's religion or not, but it'll happen 
very much more intensely if they believe they have a mandate from heaven to do so. It's a terrific force multiplier. Um, I think there would have been a quarrel between the Hutu and the Tutsi of Rwanda, say, once Belgian colonialism had established that there were these two different character groups, types, that is, the tribes. But it's a terrific force multiplier that the Catholic Church was as strong as it was in Rwanda, the most Christian country in Africa, made it infinitely worse. What makes the Israel-Palestine two-state solution ungettable? Because there are, there's a chunk of people on both sides who say they have God in their corner and God gave only their group the land. And they can negate the votes of everybody else, including the whole of the international community, by the way, just because of their faith. Northern Ireland is the same. There would have been a Republican nationalist dispute. It's infinitely worse because of religion. So I think the... the, the the, the possible, the corollary I'd like to hold would be that the less religion there was, the less violence there would be. But I can't, I can't, in, good, I can't in good Darwinian conscience say that. But I think the more that, the more that people refused orders that were divine, as for example, to take the preposterous allegation that the rabbi makes that the wars of the 20th century were secular wars, the belt buckle worn by every soldier in the Nazi army that says, Gott mit uns, God on our side. I don't think that was a help to you. Things were bad enough as they were. On page 70, I think it is, of Mein Kampf, Hitler says that in taking on the, the filthy virus of Judaism, I know I'm doing the work of the Lord, and I'm called, I'm summoned by the Lord to do this work. A book, one of the very few books the Vatican didn't ban in that period, by the way. Um, I don't think that was a help either. So I'd say, on the whole, we'd be better off without the belief either in a supreme dictator, because that leads to violence, or the idea that God takes sides in our pathetic mammalian disputes. I want to just, Thank as you. a coda to this, mm. when you say that we shouldn't take orders, I just want to remind you of, of a long history. For example, the abolition of slavery was almost entirely the work of people who believed they were taking orders from something higher than societal orders. Wilberforce in England, um, here, you know, Beecher and John Brown and so on, they believed they were doing God's work by abolishing slavery. And it's interesting that so the abolition the of slavery, it's interesting the abolition of slavery was a Christian movement, but the, the idea is it's not an issue of who you take orders from. It's an issue of the orders you take. That's the issue. And well, it comes down in part to what kind of religion you practice, not whether you practice religion. Comrades. I just, I'm sorry. Comrades? I just, what kind of orders you take. Brothers That's and it comes sisters. Down brothers and sisters. That's better. Comrades. Right. It, it, I suppose it is somewhat to the credit of some Christians that in the waning decades of thousands of years of slavery that were biblically mandated, some of them belatedly joined things like the American Anti-Slavery Society, stars of which were Thomas Paine, um, Benjamin Franklin, non-believers, right? Whereas to the last day of the Confederacy, the flag of the Confederacy said Deo Vindice, God on our side. And every justification for that slavery came from the Bible, where indeed it's not hard to find it. We're going to take questions from the audience in about all. one minute. There are microphones. If you have questions, make your way, uh, and we will take them very shortly. As we begin to do that, may I ask Christopher Hitchens, Hello. you've debated Rabbi David Wolpe on yes. this subject. You've debated the Reverend Al Sharpton. Yes. What's the difference between these debates? Well, the Reverend L. Sharpton is another case of, of the damage done by society, to society by religion, because once it was agreed by the rest of America that black people are best led by preachers, and once it was agreed to write out of the civil rights record the heroic black secularists like Bayard Rustin and the great black union uh, leader Philip Randolph, who actually organized with the help of the United Automobile Workers the March on Washington. Once all that had been forgotten, and we decide, yeah, black people, they really love their preachers, then once Dr. King has gone, it's one succession of junk demagogues after another, all of them given the mantle because they're in holy orders. There's no fraudulence you can't get away with in this country if you can get the word reverend put in front of your name. Questions from Sharpton's the audience. a very conspicuous example of that. We'll begin right here. Madam, your question. Sir. Sir, oh. I can't see. I'm sorry. The light. Yeah. Hedges, Hitchens, Mr. Hedges, Adam, yeah, sir. Yeah, I'm going to come there and beat you up. Now. Sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Later. Okay. Uh, it seems uh, to me that uh, you know, most religions deal with uh, operational aspects of life, such as 
human capital development, that is the um, uh, accumulation of literacy and technology, economic development, mental and physical well-being, and public service, which deals with charity and those kinds of things. These are, the, the, these are the work of religion, you're saying? Yes, that they profess this, yes. And that all faiths um, profess these things. And since they do, uh, it seems to me that it's not so much their profession that causes the negative externalities but between people who profess these things, but it's the labels that they, that they take hold, such as uh, I think um, Mr. Hitchens alluded to the fact that people say things uh, about their faith that they actually don't practice or believe. And so I'm saying that should we just abandon uh, these labels and stop calling ourselves Jews, Christians, or Muslims, or whatever, and deal with the operational uh, uh, facts of life which deal with, again, human capital, you know, literacy, uh, eco economic development, uh, mental and physical well-being, and public service and charity, helping others without the okay. labels. Rabbi? Um, if, I understand, um, if I understand your question correctly, I would say this. The largest organized groups of charities in the world over and over and over again all around the world organize themselves around religious groups. I don't think that that's a mistake and I don't think that that's a coincidence. So that in fact if you disband the idea that we're doing this as a religious group sure. you will in one stroke undo a great deal of the good that happens in the world. So no, I think that communities, which by the way Without religions, I don't know where you get communities where young and old sit together in common purpose. It's very rare, especially in our atomized society. If you disband that, I think you get trouble. Christopher, without community, without Im the labels? Implied, implied in what uh, David says is um, that a person exists who would say, now that I don't believe in God, I'll stop giving money to charity. I don't care anymore. I don't, know, I don't think there is such a person. And if that were so, it would be a very strange religion that they'd been professing. Who will then, organize then good works in the absence that, of religion? Why is it that in survey after well, survey, religious people do give more, and religious people you. watch less television and have use it's, drugs less and use religion, alcohol this less? This is less what it, religion is down to. It has it. social utility. It's very impressive to me. Oh, okay, this is, good. It's, often, it's very often the first thing. When we debate with Catholics, they always change the subject to charity right away. With Jews, it's usually a little later. You just okay? said that they... And with Muslims... <laughs> And with, Muslims, and with Muslims, it's, it's at the all end. the time. Because what, what else can they... They don't want to defend their faith. But you just said they the just opposite. Said, they you just, just said that they don't they don't want to you didn't believe they you wouldn't do it. They don't want to defend their faith. They don't want to say... They, don't, they feel uneasy talking about redemption, salvation, all this kind of thing. But, but look at the good work we've done. If you talk to the Mormons, they'll say, you, should, you may not think much of Joseph Smith. And I say, you got that right. Said, but, boy, you, you should see our missionaries in Peru. So government will do the work if What's religion this, does not. Excuse me, government? What, what has this got to do with the existence of God or the validity of religious claims? It has nothing to do with it. Social utility. Which is why it's always introduced yeah, as a time-wasting tactic. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, no, don't it. applaud that. Nothing I'm, to do he, with it. He just... <laughs> <laughs> but... All right, all of you who applauded, I just want to ask you this. If Christopher says to me, God doesn't exist, and I say, but we do good things, he's got a point. But his previous comment was, people who don't believe in religion do good things. In response, I say, in response to the question, people who believe in religion do good things in a to a greater extent. And then he says, well, why aren't you talking about whether God exists? You made an argument against the social utility of religion. Said, uh, I then made an argument for have, the social wait, utility of religion, not, and you not, turned theological on me. I have, I have not conceded that it's to a greater extent. Let me give you an example. With the great uh, Brazilian photographer, Sebastião Salgado, whose wonderful work on the primary producers of the third world, you ought to, you ought to be familiar with, like one of the great photographers. He's the ambassador, as the UNICEF calls it, the United Nations <coughs> Children's Fund, for the eradication of polio. I went with him all over Bengal, we, went, we, we got it down to the point where, except for a few bits of Afghanistan and uh, El Salvador, polio was almost gone from the world. Mm. It could go with smallpox. Not a small thing. Done by UNICEF, a secular, or, a secular organization. And we nearly got, it was, a date was announced, but we were pretty sure polio would be gone. And it spread back. Yeah. Because largely Muslim groups in Nigeria, and also in parts of Bengal and Afghanistan, told people, don't go get your children inoculated. It's a, it's a plot. 
by scientists and Jews and others to sterilize Muslims. And that plus the Hajj, that plus the wonderful devotional habit of, of going to Mecca all the time and taking all your diseases with you has meant that polio is back all the way across Africa now. So I'm not going to have it said that in order to do good, you've got to be more religious than someone it, it, who... It's complicated, but I want you another question, if I may, sir. All the practical evidence yes. is the other way, and it's nothing to do with the claims All the of practical faith. evidence. Nothing. Okay. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first comment to Mr. Hitchens. Thank you for a very well-argued book. Oh. You and I are in violent agreement. <laughs> Uh, it. Second, it seems to me, n not to talk about religion and faith for the moment, but the question as to whether God exists. Let's not duck that one. Uh, it, seems, it seems to me that to discuss that subject, one needs to have some scientific knowledge. My question is very simply to Rabbi Wolpe, uh, and please take a second to think about it. Uh, my question is, and I've asked this of priests, reverends, and rabbis many times. We're ready. <laughs> My We're question brave. is, if no one ever explained God to you, not in writing, not orally, would you have figured it out? Thank you. So, first of all, I think that it's important to understand that the idea that there's an inbuilt opposition between scientific knowledge and belief is contradicted by some very prominent scientists, including Francis Collins, who's the head of the Human Genome Project, who wrote a book in favor of God, Owen Gingrich, who's an astrophysicist at Harvard, who wrote a book talking about his belief in God. I always find it interesting that people assume that the expertise they have is necessary in order to make the assertion that someone else makes, um, and if they don't have it, then they can't speak about it. I grew up in a home where one of my brothers is a uh, PhD in bioethics and the other one is a PhD in developmental biology. They talk science all the time. I think for a layperson, I have a reasonably good grasp of, uh, of some sciences. And I would say, absolutely, I can make the assertion that God exists precisely because the criteria that is used for a scientific assertion is not used for a religious assertion. Nobody asks, a, in the same way that you make philosophical statements that are not subject to scientific criteria. If you, for, if you ask yourself, what does the world look like to something that's not human, to a bat, to an ant? The answer is, we can't possibly know that because we can't unknow what we know and we can't look at the world through different eyes. So if you ask me, would I have come to this belief that it wasn't explained to me? My only evidence to answer that is, yes, human beings did. And either it was explained to them by God, which is what I assume, or you would come to it naturally. So, yeah, I think I would come to it naturally, but can I prove that to you? No, it is precisely one of the many examples of unprovable questions that we nonetheless can feel deeply about. My point, though, is that early on... Is this a debate? Or is this is a early on... Uh, Sorry, let, let me put it to Christopher. Yeah. Do, do you Sorry. assume that everything will one day be solved scientifically, or does it matter to you? No. All, all the science is going to do is keep on teaching us how little we know and multiplying the distance between our, our own attainments and, and our desire to master these matters. The, many of these questions will remain undecidable, which is the way I like them. Religion and science can coexist in the same person, that's true. Now, I know Francis Collins. Um, he writes, he's brilliant on the genome, but if you've read C.S. Lewis, you don't need to read him on religion. It's unbelievably naive. Sir Isaac Newton was an alchemist, um, a, a very strong, if rather superstitious Christian. He thought the Pope was the Antichrist, might have been onto something there. <laughs> but a very, very, very weird, full of very weird beliefs. I thought if you knew the measurements of the old temple, you'd know more than if you understood gravity. Alfred Russell Wallace, who did most of Darwin's work for him, was a spiritualist, would go to table wrapping sessions, listening to burblings from the beyond. Um, Joseph Priestley was a Unitarian and believed in the phlogiston theory. Shouldn't that be a but late It's really problem? only until, I would say it's only until Albert Einstein, not, not until, I mean, Albert Einstein, that you get a scientist who's also essentially a philosopher of pure mind. That's the great breakthrough. And now you can have private beliefs and be a, a, a scientific person, but no one says, my science helps to vindicate my religion. No one says that anymore. That, that's not doable. I, I want to get to more questions, please. Yes, I have a question for both of you regarding um, the existence of a universal, universal morality. My yes. question for Mr. Hitchens, is there one? And if so, where does it come from? 
And my question for the rabbi is, if there is one, and it's, for example, in the 613 mitzvot, how do you personally uh, pick and choose which ones to follow? Because I notice, you know, you're not wearing tzitzit and some of the <laughs> other um, prescriptions. So if it's I might universally... Be. They might be under my shirt. <laughs> well, there are... Uh, I won't go there. Yeah. But... Um, <laughs> Generally speaking, can you be a good Jew and not follow right. the 613 if that is the prescription for universal yeah. uh, morality? Well, the most commonly taken um, universal, absolute moral statement is what's sometimes called the golden rule, um, which, well, Rabbi Hillel says, don't do to another person what would be repulsive to you. Others say, do as you would be done by, just putting it the other way. It's in the Analects of Confucius. It's very few societies don't have it. Um, so I think that's what we'd have to take as the nearest to an absolute. It's obviously subject to various relativities, uh, alas. For one thing, it's only really as good as the person saying it. Um, should I not do to Charles Manson? Should I not do to Charles Manson what I don't want him to do to me? Well. <laughs> If you see what I mean, I mean, should we say, oh, let's do to Charles Manson what we wouldn't want done to ourselves? Obviously not. Um, it's just like the, the contradiction in the, between the Old and the New Testaments. The Old Testament says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, which would lead to a very eyeless and toothless world. <laughs> and then the, the Nazarene says, you can't condemn anyone unless you can cast the first stone. Actually, that bit was knitted into the Bible quite late and is almost certainly a fabrication. But it's believed in by many Christians who, you know, as you know, will believe practically anything. But <laughs> if, if you can't condemn anyone without being yourself without sin, then we can't even arrest Charles Manson unless we were sinless ourselves. So these moral absolutes are actually more full of moral relativism than you might think. And certain, the reason people want there to be absolutes is this. They want there to be an absolute authority who can give them to you. Because wouldn't that save you all the trouble of thinking out ethics for yourself? Which is where I started. But Why not take that chance? More enjoyable, yeah. less subject to appalling commandments to stone witches and uh, murder and homosexuals. Very good, and all the rest. Yeah, all uh, Rabbi, universal uh, morality, and, and if there is the... Um, which, I'm, not, I'm, not entire, I'm not sure that Christopher said whether he believes in a universal morality, but yes, someone who believes in God assumes that there is a universal morality, but also assumes that it's very hard, and it's not that the 613 meets vote instantiate universal morality. Um, and moral reasoning, as far as I know, is certainly in other traditions, but, but obviously in Judaism, is an essential part of the Jewish tradition. It's not that you get out of thinking by being part of the Jewish tradition. In fact, questioning, reasoning, wondering, thinking, objecting is an essential part of Judaism. Um, anybody who studies Talmud knows it's filled with objections and questions. But the assumption is that there actually is a right and a wrong in any given case. If all human beings are evolved primates, there's not a right and a wrong. There's a better and a worse. There's a more powerful and less powerful. Nietzsche was exactly right. If God is dead, then power is all that matters. Because ultimately, there isn't a right and a wrong. There's something that promotes your interest and something that negates your interest. But I don't believe that. Excuse me. Do you or do you not believe that human beings are evolved primates? Yes. But, you but say, I also believe. You say moral, but I also believe. I said if are. all they are. I said if all they are is evolved primates, as opposed to evolved primates who have a spark of the eternal in them, which I believe we do. Question. Um, two questions for Mr. Hitchens. Um, the first one is I was taught by a physics professor um, that if you go back to the Big Bang, beginning of the universe. In the first one to the 61st of the first second, the entire universe is in a tiny mm -hmm. amount of space. And at that size, space and time can cross. And his point was that the whole universe uh, came into existence out of a hiccup in the space-time warp. And therefore, it's just kind of a, a big accident that we were here. And so my question is the same one that I posed to him that day. Why is there a space-time warp? Um, which leads me to the second question, which is, wouldn't it make more sense that there would be nothing? There is, should be no universe, there should be no space-time warp, there should be none of us, um, and unless we're hooked into the matrix right now, 
um, we seem to be here. And so... You take that as an argument for God? Is that what you're saying? For something. There's a great mystery at the core of the universe. And then why are we here is the second question. Uh, to That's argue all. those out. Okay. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'd, I'd, again, I'd commend to you someone who's much more expert on this subject. I started by mentioning Lawrence Krauss's lecture on a whole universe from nothing. But is, where's the grandeur, where's the divinity in the hiccup? And who produces the hiccupper? In that all you get from this is an infinite regression. Who creates this creator? Who, it, 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 it gets you nowhere. Um, and again, as a, if you do make the assumption, which I can't dispute or certainly cannot refute, that there is a first cause or an uncaused cause, it still doesn't mean that there's a God who takes sides, answers prayers, enjoins morals. I didn't ask about that. No. 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 So, but I mean, so I'm afraid you only, you compel me to somewhat to repeat myself. Can I just ask a quick question yes. about what you just said? If it's an assumption that you can't refute, I, which I understand, I think everybody here would say you can't prove that there's not a God. That doesn't mean that there is one. But if it's an assumption that you can't refute, why is it that when someone says, I believe that it is true, do you say they're lying? I didn't say that they're lying. You said I to don't. me, when someone stands well, at say, the... No, I say, someone when you who, lie... Someone, someone, yes. who goes to the, someone who goes to tell a child that if they don't behave well, they'll go to hell. That's not... That wasn't the example that we someone used. who goes to the deathbed... Of, and of says that I believe that there's a going, world other than this you're one. You're going to a better place. Is, a, is a, I think, a charlatan, a charlatan a nauseating charlatan. I'll, I'll let it. And the question is uh, whether uh, religious people uh, at the highest level have a better understanding of themselves than people who claim to be atheists. Mm. And in particular, we can ask the question, is, is Mr. Hitchens himself really as great an atheist as he claims? Um, uh, he's pretty good. Uh, yeah, he's pretty good. <laughs> Mr. Hitchens, are you a closet believer? <laughs> no, a, a point of agreement between the rabbi and myself is that the human species, mammalian, primate, so on, though it undoubtedly is, and made out of the dust of exploded suns, uh, does have a, a need for, I would say, the, the, the transcendent, would be one word, the numinous, um, even the ecstatic. Um, wouldn't trust anyone who hadn't felt this. And it has obviously to do with landscape, light, uh, music, love, and I think also a, a permanent awareness of the transience of all things and, the, and the, the melancholy that invests all this. So it isn't just gaping happily at a sunset while listening to music. You're doing that knowing that it can't last for very long. Very important part of the awareness. Um, People who didn't have this would, I think, be beyond autistic. But there's no need for the supernatural in this at all. There is no supernatural dimension of which this gives you a share. And yes, of course, for poetry and literature, we are, we are rather stuck with the pathetic fallacy, if you know what I mean. The pathetic fallacy is giving human attributes to material things. Um, so and we're, we're tempted to do that too. Re Rabbi, can oh, just be saved? Word, just on the word evil, though, I, I personally find, find it a a word you absolutely have to have. Um, I decided this in Iraq, as a matter of fact, after I'd seen the Saddam Hussein's attempt with, with chemical weapons to destroy the Kurdish people of northern Iraq, I'd seen the, as it were, the stench of evil. I thought, now, everything else that you can say about Saddam Hussein, psychopathic dictator, mass murderer, genocidalist, bad guy, as some people used to call him, things of this kind, was, wasn't up to it. There was a surplus value to totalitarianism a sort of a numinous bit, a shimmer around it, that meant that we, evil is a word we could not do without. Do, do you see in he who speaks up for the numinous the possibility of belief? Do you smell a potential person of faith in Hitchens or no way, no how? I, I, I think, no, I, I mean, to be perfectly honest and not to make a, a cheap um, uh, joke about it, I think that Christopher is a person of tremendous impressive faith, not the faith that I have at all, but faith in justice, faith in goodness. I mean, what he's done with much of his life is, I think, really awe-inspiring. That doesn't mean for a minute that I think that he's being dishonest about his lack of faith in the things that I believe, but does he have faith in a different sense? Absolutely. Can we do more? Yes. Um, uh, Mr. Hitchens, um, you are likely the, the world's most charming, roguish, and uh, enlightened atheist, and I love you for that. 
But uh, as a Sufi Muslim, I'm very ruffled by the title of your book. Of all the titles that you likely had at your disposal, did you have to settle for the uh, literal negation of Allahu Akbar? Yes. I thought, yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you. Oh, it's a very good question, I'm glad. I wanted to come well, back to it. Um, Why? Yeah. The, as I've said, I, I think that all religions are wrong in the same way, in, in that they privilege uh, faith over over reason, but they're not all equally bad in the same way all the time. I mean, if I'd been writing in the 1930s, I would certainly have said that the Roman Catholic Church was the most dangerous religion in the world because of its open alliance with fascism and anti-Semitism, which the damage from that our culture has n never recovered from and, and never will. But at the moment, it's very clear to me that the, the most toxic form that religion takes is the Islamic form. The horrible idea of wanting to end up with Sharia with a religion governed state, a state of religious law, and that the best means of getting there is jihad, holy war, and that Muslims have a special right to feel aggrieved enough to demand this, I think is absolute obscene wickedness, and I think their religion is nonsense. And the, the I, entire, I had, in, I had its an, in its entirety, the, in its entirety, the, the idea of what God speaks to some illiterate merchant warlord in Arabia, and he's able to write this down perfectly, and it contains the answers to all you know, don't, don't, don't waste my time, it's bullshit. But, but you're saying the same also about that, it. Also that God, that God speaks, the Archangel Gabriel speaks only Arabic, it seems. I just want to say, in retrospect, crap. you were very civil, actually. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> this is, no, this is... Uh, is this, this the is same a characterization of all religions? Uh, well, then? actually, no, because remember, Islam makes one special claim for itself. All religions claim to be revealed truth. They all are founded by divine revelation. But Islam rather dangerously says, ours is the last and final one. There can't be any more after this. This is God's last word. Now, that's straight away a temptation to violence and intolerance. And if you note, it's a temptation they seem quite willing to fall for. Re Rabbi, Second, do you have any... Uh, I had another motive. Yes. Another motive, which is this. If you remember Dick Gregory, the older comrades here will, great black comedian and civil rights activist, when he came to write his memoir, he called it nigger. Right. It upset a lot of people, including his old mum, who called him and said, why are you doing this? And he says, mama, every time you hear that word again, they're selling my book. <laughs> <laughs> so every, every Allahu Akbar reminds people that we're in a very serious struggle with a very depraved religion. And there are, and there help Sufi is available. Friend, you, you, you give look, no quarter? I, I, look, he believes in the prophecy of Muhammad. I'm sorry to say, I, I think he's been at best conned. Yeah. Our time is ticking down. Um, With respect, if I may be the protocol guy, sorry. <laughs> well, I, I want to go back to your answer to the question just before this. Uh, because I think, and, and particularly, uh, I want to interrogate you, Rabbi, um, because you, in your uh, earlier discussion and your answer to a couple of the questions, uh, you seem to suggest that if there's something beyond the material, that's evidence for God, or it, uh, and then on the question of uh, whether there can be moral behavior, one can have a reason to act morally. Uh, you say that only, you know, that requires the existence of God if there's no exist, if God doesn't exist, you don't believe in God, you don't have reasons to behave morally. But then I think in your answer, so I think that's where it was until your answer to the question before last, and at that point you seem to grant that the gentleman sitting uh, to your left um, uh, actually uh, did have reasons to act morally, even though he does not believe in God. Yes, that's uh, right. And I'm trying to figure out... I'll explain. The, uh, the difference is not whether people in their own minds have compelling reasons to act morally. The question is, if you don't believe in God and you say, you know what, I'm going to... For, uh, why would you do good in secret? As, as, uh, as Balzac put it, uh, perhaps only believers in God do good in secret. Now, obviously, that's not true, but you understand the ideology behind it, which is... If you don't believe that there's a universal moral code that comes from beyond us and that human beings make up what's right and what's wrong, why is it that I as a human being can't decide this is right for me even though I know it's going to be wrong for anyone else? 
In other words, the standard that arises only from human beings is easily broken by human beings, whereas if you think that goodness is woven into the fabric of the universe, which is what a believer says, then it's always wrong at all times, in all places, whether someone's watching or they're not watching, whether you're a believer or you're not a believer, that's always true, and that's the distinction I was trying to get at. I was very struck, because uh, this is the core question, um, so we might as well revisit it. I was very struck this week reading, I'm sure you saw it, the Pope's brother, Monsignor Georg Ratzinger, who runs the choir school in Regensburg. Yes. He's discovered recently there's been some unpleasantness at this school, um, of which he was the steward for about 20, 30 years. He said he didn't know about any of that, and surely claims not to have taken any part in it, but he said he did used to smack the boys around quite a lot. He said, until Bavarian law changed and made it illegal for teachers to hit children. Right. So, well, I don't want to be told anymore that without religious people we wouldn't know what morality was. He didn't know this until the secular law intervened <laughs> and taught him how to behave. Now, wait, 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 wait. What is the church, what is the whole racket of the church in this protecting itself from? It's saying they were all ordered, don't go near the courts, don't go near the police. We'll sort, we'll sort this out among ourselves. And they say they're the people who prevent us from succumbing to moral relativism. I'm not hearing it from them. I'm sorry, it's insulting to be talked to in that way. The great recent governor of this state, Mr. Romney, wants to be president. Okay, there's a constitutional issue here. Mormons are supposed to say that they're prophet, as, the, as they call their leader. His word is sovereign over anyone else's, including the Constitution of the United States. So Romney has to say, and finally people did force him to answer the question, well, do you think that about your prophet? He said, no, the Constitution takes precedence in all cases. Fine. So to the extent that he's an acceptable person, it's to the extent he's not a Mormon. The discipline, of, the discipline of secularism the discipline of secularism is necessary to civilize these superstitions. I hope very few of you begin your day by thanking God that you're not a female or a goy. Our time is For short. Example. We're going to swing around just a little bit. Yes, back here. Okay. Uh, this is for Mr. Wolpe. Uh, at the start of your talk, you said your belief was scientific, but you spent the rest of the talk backpedaling from that. Uh, but my real question is about free will. Uh, you say that you cannot get free will from a deterministic system. I can create a pseudo-random number generator that you cannot distinguish from randomness, no matter how long you look at it. it can, it'll take right. longer than the life of the universe. Right. Uh, so, you're, so when that, it, does, it, that gives you randomness. That doesn't give you intentional free will. And I never uh, said but at if the beginning. Give, but if you I didn't use say that at the beginning, by the way, that my belief was scientific. Okay. But if consistent. you use that as an output, it's deterministic, but it gives you a random result that you can use right. for free will. Now, where did your That's deity no. get free will, if, you, if it has it? If it doesn't have it, it's not much of a deity. If it does have free will, either it got it itself, why can't we do it? Or some other deity gave your deity free will, which gives you infinite regress. This will well, be our the, last question, the, I'm afraid. I'm the, afraid. Answer, yes. the answer is that there is no analogy between the deity and between human beings. Just like when someone says, who gave birth to God, that's a misconceiving of the religious concept of God, which is that God has always existed, and God isn't a biological creature, therefore God doesn't get free will the way human beings get free will. The, the objection and the problem with human beings getting free will is that if we're purely biological, how does that alchemical, metaphysical free will get into us? And a random generator doesn't give you free will, even if it gave you random numbers, that's quite different from actual choosing to do something or to do something else. Well, who do you think in our society is winning this debate? The atheists, the new atheists, the religious? Who's, where's the center of gravity going? And this will be the last question, I'm afraid. I think a very large number of people um, don't, and I, I, they say this based on experience debating in a large number of churches and, and synagogues, um, go there for some of the reasons the rabbi gives. Community, Tocquevillian reasons, you might say. American, American communities, mm. charities, self-help, often they run a school, this kind of thing. They don't really believe the holy books. They don't think they have been specially noticed by God or have, uh, can expect any special favors from him. But they see, as it were, no harm in it. Um, and there's a great deal of schism among those who do believe, an enormous amount of schism. So when people say in opinion polls that or when you read that 90% of Americans believe in the virgin birth and in Satan and so forth, I don't believe it at all. I don't believe it. And I don't believe people had doubts about it would tell it was someone who rang them up in their kitchen on the telephone either. I think that underneath this there's a huge crust of doubt and a great resentment against American theocrats. Uh, they, they, you, if you wanted to know how to piss off an American Protestant in the South, say, oh, are you one of those Jerry Falwell people? They hate that. 
rightly. Um, do you, do you, think, you think you're winning then? You well, think no, I, no I, think that, I think that the, the supposed religious mo monolithic nature of the, uh, America is grossly overstated. It doesn't describe reality. And it is certainly true, as one of the questioners mentioned, that the number of those who say, not that they're atheists, we're still a very small minority, but those who say that they have no faith and no allegiance to any church has doubled in the last few years. And that's according to a decent opinion survey, the Pew one, not a random right. poll. Rabbi, where do you see the center of gravity? And it'll, double, it'll, it'll double toward again. Toward you, toward Christopher, somewhere else? Um, I, I, I'm not, I mean, I, I don't have a sociological expertise. I can't tell you. Uh, in terms of statistics where it's going, this is what I would say. I think that there are lots of reasons why organized religion has trouble. Many of them have been enumerated by Christopher. Uh, there are various other reasons as well. But I actually think that the impulse to piety and the sense of something greater than ourselves is deeply implanted in human beings and will never go away. And in that sense, although people will find different expressions for their religious belief, um, I feel quite confident that actually um, most people will continue to be religious in the sense of believing that, uh, that in fact life isn't uh, an empty howling wilderness the way that Christopher describes it, but that, in, <laughs> but that, there, is, that there is something deep, lasting, eternal, meaningful about you, about those you love, and about the world that we live in. Rabbi David Wolpe, Christopher Hitchens, your great audience. Thank you very much.